Okay, so I guess uh, last phase of the course, you had the quiz. Hope, hope it was okay. Uh, I didn't see any results or anything at this point, so just the look on your faces indicates that you're very happy. No, I don't know. Um, but look, you know, we've got, we've got a few more topics to go. And so I guess there's two more weeks of this regular class, and then I have four more reviews much closer to the exam, and the dates will be sent out by email and, and, and posted on Blackboard. Um, and I don't remember what they are, but I believe they started around the 14th, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's the first one. So uh, there's four classes, and I'm going to cover all of the post-midterm material, because all of the pre-midterm material summary is still on that video, and the tape took about three hours, three and a half hours anyway. So you have that you can watch. And so I'm going to do the post-midterm material and have plenty of time for questions. All right, so the plan for the next two weeks then is just to cover section 7.3, 4, and 5, and then the two sections in chapter 8 and chapter 9 each that we have to do. So it sounds like a lot of sections, but uh, some of them are actually quite small. 7.5 is mostly a review of complex numbers, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that. All right, so that's, that's my plan. But as always, I'm here for you, so if you have, if, if there's some collective thought that we should spend time going over the quiz, say, then I'm happy to do that too. So I'm at your disposal, and I open the floor to suggestions, if any, other than just digging straight into 7.3, which is my plan. Tally-ho. All right. You never know. Sometimes people say, hey, I'd really like to just go over this thing, and that's cool too. All right. Well, look, uh, let us uh, proceed with 7.3. And now, 7.2 concerned finding eigenvalues. So, roughly speaking, 7.3 is finding eigenvectors. All right, so essentially then, by way of review, we saw that, so we're given a matrix A, and we want to find a vector V such that A times V, that's the matrix times the vector, you end up with V again, or a multiple of V, and the multiple the actual scale of the lamp is the eigenvalue, and V is the eigenvector. And so <laughs> what we've seen by manipulating this into A minus lambda I V, we need the identity here. This A is square, N by N, and this is the N by N identity matrix I or I N. Uh, that's got to be equal to zero, the zero vector. In other words, V is in the kernel of a minus lambda i. And we looked at the determinant of this as the characteristic polynomial. This is all stuff that was on the quiz. Now, the interesting thing is that this is reversible. So if v is in the kernel, then that's true, and therefore v is an eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector for eigenvalue lambda. And so the eigenspace, which is written e lambda, which is exactly this kernel of a minus lambda i. This is all the vectors, all the eigenvectors for eigenvalue lambda. Right? It gives it gives you all of them, plus technically the zero vector, because it's technically zero, it's not really an eigenvector. Zero would be an eigenvector for every single eigenvalue, so we kind of don't call it an eigenvector. But basically, this, this is the eigenspace, and it is a subspace. It is a subspace, because the kernel of any matrix is a subspace. This matrix A minus lambda I N is still a square matrix, so its kernel is a subspace of R N. Now, if lambda is not an eigenvalue, then the subspace E lambda is just the zero vector. That's the only vector in the kernel. So it's just these specific numbers, the specific eigenvalues, lambda, which kind of, as you plug that in there for that particular thing, bing, you get a kernel that's not trivial. As in not just a zero vector. All 
All right, so how do you find the eigenvalues? Well, we've already seen to find the eigenvalues, you compute the determinant of a minus lambda i. This is the characteristic polynomial f a of lambda and find the zeros. So we already saw that in 7.2. How do you now find the eigenvectors? By the way, e vowels and e vex is going to be my abbreviation. That's not a standard abbreviation, but there you go. To find the eigenvectors, what you have to do for each eigenvalue, just compute the kernel of a minus lambda i. So each eigenvalue lambda. So we need to know how to compute kernels. We have a couple of ways, but basically you use the gauss jordan elimination. The kernel, remember, is nothing more. So if you want to find the kernel of b, that's solving bx equals 0. That's the same as finding the kernel. It's all pre-midterm stuff. It's pre-midterm stuff. So let me give you an example. So suppose we let A be this matrix, and hopefully I won't miscopy it like I've done on a number of occasions. Three zero minus two minus seven zero four four zero minus three. All right. So if we want to find the eigenvectors of this matrix, what we have to do first is find the eigenvalues. Right? I say here to find e vex for each eigenvalue lambda, compute this kernel. But that means you have to find the eigenvalues first. So first, let's consider the determinant of a minus lambda i. So that's the determinant of 3 minus lambda, 0 minus 2, minus 7, minus lambda, lambda or, or, or 0 minus 3 minus lambda. OK, so there's a variety of different ways that you can actually compute this determinant. But I think the easiest would be expansion around here, around that column, because that column is 0 everywhere except in the middle one. So there's the most zeros in that column. So if we expand around that column, we will have this element times this minor determinant here. So this is equal to minus lambda times and then we can so we cross out that and so we'll have this times this minus this times this and there might be a minus or a plus out the front we'll, we'll be careful about that in a second but so one thing we'll have is 3 minus lambda minus 3 minus lambda subtract so that's this times this subtract this times this so minus minus 2 times 4 Okay, so what do you get? Oh, and I said I'd see... Actually, it doesn't matter whether we get plus or minus here because we just care about the zeros of the determinant. But remember the pattern of plus, minus, plus... Uh, sorry, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus. It tells you what whether you put a plus or a minus depending on which uh, coefficient you're expanding around. So this one's got a plus. So this is correct. This is correct. Anyway, let's simplify this. Keep the factor of minus lambda. What have we got here? We'll actually have lambda squared. This is a difference of two squared. <coughs> a minus b minus a minus b. So uh, we'll get essentially lambda squared minus 9. And then we have to add 8. So this is lambda squared minus 1. And so we have minus lambda lambda minus 1, lambda plus 1. All right, so the eigenvalues are the solutions of this equals 0, which is 0, 1, minus 1. Jolly good. Now, time to find some eigenvectors. And we're going to find eigenvectors for each of the three individually. So for lambda equals 0, 
we need to find kernel of a minus zero i, which is just the kernel of a, which is the matrix itself. Three, zero, minus two, minus seven, zero, four, four, zero, minus three. Now, two ways of doing it. There's the brute force way, and then there's the sneaky way. I'll do the brute force way. So we take this, and basically the Gauss-Jordan elimination says, if you want, you can set up a separate thing. But actually, when you do Gauss-Jordan elimination, the kernel's the same. So this is the same as the kernel of. Uh, so we could divide the top and get this mess here. Minus 7. OK, now we need to add seven lots of this, more's the pity. And you'll have zero, 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 and we need to add minus 14 thirds to four. I guess that's minus two thirds again. And then finally, I'm going to subtract four lots of this first row from here, so you get four. minus two-thirds times four. So I think it's minus a third. Anyway, so this now, of course, the bottom, this last row, this can become one and one, and so you'll find the next step in the, elim in the elimination goes like this, and then you can also subtract that and get this. So the kernel of that is pretty obvious. It's just the middle you're going to have to have this coefficient is zero and this co as in the, the first and the third have to be zero. So this is clearly just the span of zero, one, zero. All right, so that's the, the brute force way. Of course, we've done it in gory detail, the full elimination. But in fact, you should just be able to see that that vector is in the kernel. Right, the middle column is zero, so clearly zero one zero is going to be in the kernel of this. But the question is, how do you know that the dimension of the kernel is only one? How come? How do you know there isn't another vector? And this is where I say you've got to be sneaky. So can anyone here tell me, based on the information on these two boards here, what is the evidence that this kernel had to have dimension one? Yes. Um, because you have three different eigenvalues. Right, you have three different eigenvalues. Each eigenvalue has at an eigenspace of dimension at least one. And they're all independent. You cannot have, we saw this last time, you, you have to have independence of different eigenvalues. We'll have eigenspaces which are linearly independent. Not necessarily orthogonal, but linearly independent. OK, so the point, as you say, three, this one's got an eigenspace that has at least one dimension. This one has an eigenspace of at least one dimension. This one has an eigenspace of at least one dimension. <coughs> and they're all linearly independent. You, so you've got three linearly independent vectors or more. But you can't have more. So each one must have dimension one. Each of these kernels is dimension one. So in this case, you could argue, look, it has to have dimension one. It can't be more than that. So the fact that I can find one vector means it is the only vector, or at least that's the only. It's a one-dimensional space. So. This is the eigen. This is an eigenvector for lambda equals zero. In any case, so whether you want to do the sneaky way or not, uh, you should make sure you know how to do that way. Now I've got to do the other two, so let's just do them quickly. Uh, lambda equals one. We need the kernel of a minus just the identity. So we go back to the original matrix, and we take away one from the diagonal elements. So you get two, zero, minus two, minus seven, zero, uh, sorry, minus one in the middle, four, and four, zero, minus four. Okay, so what I've done is taken the original matrix and I put minus one, I, I took minus one, or rather I took one away from each of the diagonal elements. Uh, this one's a little easier to compute. I divide this one by 2, and I get 1, 0, minus 1, which happens to be the same as the last row, as it turns out. Now let's immediately add 7 lots of this to this. Again, 0, 0. 7 lots of 0 added to minus 1 is still minus 1. And then 7 lots of minus 2, I'm sorry, 7 lots of minus 1 added to 4 is minus 3. 
right? I'm adding seven lots of that row to here. And so you get minus three, and then add four lots of this top row to this bottom row here, and you get zero, zero, zero. And so if you look at it, sorry, this is in the way here. What this is saying is, okay, this third one has to be the same as the first. So if we write one there, one. Whereas this one has to be minus three lots of this, of the. So if I take minus three times minus one, I get one plus minus three is zero. So that's the kernel. There's multiple ways of going from there, but basically that's the quick, quick way. And lambda minus one, you take the kernel of A plus the identity, which is now the kernel of all four, 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 zero, minus two, minus seven, one, four, four, zero, minus two. And again, it's not so bad. I'm going to cheat and just tell you that the answer is dot, dot, dot. Find the span is one minus one, two. And you can check not only that these are in the kernels, but if you actually take each of these three vectors and multiply them by A on the left, you should get the correct thing. So in the case of this vector 1 minus 3, 1, multiply it by A, and you should get 1 minus 3, 1. What do you expect to get if you multiply A by this? You get negative 1, 1, negative 2, right? Because the eigenvalue is minus 1. So you should get minus 1 times this. Again, this is not the only eigenvector. This is the eigenspace. It's a span of a one-dimensional vector. So any multiple of it is also an eigenvector for the same eigenvalue, minus 1. This is not just a unique eigenvector. At least a one-dimensional space of it. All right, so that's all very nice. Now, that's an example where there are three different eigenspaces, each of dimension 1 for a 3 by 3 matrix. But I just really wanted to show you that all you have to be able to do is find a kernel, which we've already known how to do. You just have to find the right kernel. Um, all right, suppose you have a reflection in a subspace V. That's a subspace. So let's call that reflection R. That's the matrix, reflection matrix. R. So what are the eigenvalues and what are the eigenspaces? That's the question. All right. Well, this is a generic sort of thing. So we need to understand what the reflection does. Remember, R of x is equal to x if x is in the subspace. Because it's like it's on the surface of the mirror. It doesn't get reflected. And it's equal to minus x if x is in v perp. So if x is actually orthogonal, it gets reflected to negative itself. And we also saw that in general, messier if neither, if x is not in v union v perp. And when I say messier, not an eigenvector, i.e. not an eigenvector not a multiple of x. You have to work out its part in v and its part in v put. Yes, Is question. There a difference between the symbols in the subspace of? You see in the first row, you wrote smaller than equal? I mean, uh, you mean here? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I just wrote it's a sub. I, v is a subset of Rn, but I wanted to clarify it's a subspace. There's not a standard notation for it being a subspace. It means just like what these three mean. X is an element of V. An element. V is a subset of Rn. Oh. X is just one vector. V is a whole space of vectors. Okay. But a subset doesn't have to be a subset. Okay. Okay. So, uh, that's, that's the difference. This is just one element of, as opposed to a subset. Anyway, the point is that we already saw that these are the only eigenvectors. So in fact, E, the eigenvalues, are 1 and minus 1, and E1 is V itself, E minus 1 is V per. 
So that's just for a reflection. Okay, E1 is the eigenspace of all the eigenvalues of eigen uh, eigenvectors for eigenvalue 1 is V itself. And the same with minus 1, except you get V perp. How different is this for an orthogonal projection onto V? What's the only difference in this whole picture, of this whole summary? Can someone tell me? The second eigenvalue is 0 and the second. OK, so you still have 1, yeah. and you have 0 for a projection. And E1 is still V, and you were going to say E0 now is V per V. Right. OK, so the, the change is that the only difference between a reflection and a projection then is that this is 0. So the eigenspace instead of minus 1 is 0. It's quite a difference, though. Reflections are invertible. Projections are not. All right. So we've been talking about this dimension, say, in this example. I talked about the dimension. So let me define now the geometric multiplicity. of an eigenvalue lambda is the dimension of the kernel. And I guess you could say, i.e., the nullity of a minus lambda i. Nullity is sort of seven letters. Dim is only three. So dim cur is still six. People tend to end right. Dim cur rather than nullity. Anyway, never mind that. Um, they're the same thing. So essentially, it's not a question of how many eigenvectors you have, but rather what's the dimension of eigenvectors that you have for this particular eigenvalue. And in this previous case, all three geometric multiplicities were one. Okay, we had three eigenvalues. The geometric multiplicities were one. Now. It is a rather sad but true fact that the geometric multiplicities do not have to add up to the dimension of the space. They do not have to add up to the dimension. And let's just see an example of that first. So I want to repeat the same thing. Now I want A to be this matrix. It's actually quite a similar matrix. Minus 1, minus... It's going to have a row of zeros down the middle so that this is artificially constructed. Actually, both of these come from the exercise in the back of the book, um, but not ones that are on the homework, I believe. So if we consider that A minus lambda I, that's the determinant of minus 1, minus lambda, 0, 1, minus 3, minus lambda, 1, <coughs> minus 4, 0, 3, minus lambda. OK, so again, I'm going to expand around here. And without much further ado, I get minus lambda times minus 1 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, minus 1 times minus 4. So I still have the minus lambda out the front. And this time, it's not a difference of squares. I'm just going to have to expand it out. I get lambda squared. I get a minus 3 lambda from there, plus lambda from there, so it's minus 2 lambda. And then I have a minus 3, but then I have a plus 4. And so this is lambda squared minus 2 lambda plus 1. If you work this out, this is minus lambda outside of lambda minus 1 all squared. So the eigenvalues are lambda equals 0 and 1. Now, what is the algebraic multiplicity? OK, remember, this is. I've just defined geometric multiplicity, but we also have the notion of algebraic multiplicity from 7.2, or you know the quiz stuff. So what is the multiplicity of 1? It's 2. And what about the multiplicity of 0? 1. OK, so this has algebraic multiplicity 1, whereas this one has algebraic multiplicity 2. And the reason why it's 2 is because of this square here. You have two factors of lambda minus 1. If you wrote this out fully, it would go minus lambda, lambda minus 1, lambda minus 1. So you can even think of the eigenvalues as 0, 1, and 1. But you normally just say 0 and 1, 
and make a mental or you could even write down the note that the algebraic multiplicity is 2. All right, so we know something about this. Now we actually have to find the eigenvectors, or I'm going to ask to find the eigenvectors to see what's going on here. All right. So let's do lambda equals zero first. So I need the kernel of a minus zero i, which is the kernel of a itself. And we can't be quite as tricky this time, at least not with the information that I've imparted. Uh, because there's only two eigenvalues. So it could be that this, this thing, thing could have had dimension two. two. Potential, based on what I've said so far. But if you do the work, you'll find that, again, it's just the span of 0, 1, 0. I am going to clarify and say something else that will tell us how actually we could have already seen it only had dimension 1. As for lambda equals 1, I will compute this. This is kernel a minus i, which is the kernel of subtract 1 from the diagonal elements here. This is what you get. You need to find that kernel. So let's take the top line and divide it by minus 2. Add three copies of that line to the second line, and you get 0, minus 1, 1 minus 3 lots of minus a half is negative a half. And then add four copies of this line to the bottom line, and you get 0, 0, 0. And if you look at what that kernel is, again, it's quite easy to read off. If we put, say, I don't know, a 1 here, then the last one's going to have to be a 2. 1 times 1 minus 2 lots of a half. On the other hand, since that's already a 2, this is going to have to be a minus 1 to make this work. Minus 1 plus 1. So that's the, eigenve that's the sole eigenvector, or the, it's a one-dimensional space. All right, so those are the only eigenvectors. And we only have two of them. A question? Yeah. Um, don't you know that the kernel of the first matrix has to be one-dimensional because the first and third columns are linearly independent? Yeah, I mean, that's another way of looking at it, is just by looking at it specifically, you could say, oh, look, the first and third columns are linearly independent. Therefore, yes, it's going to be one-dimensional kernel. Good, but there's another way of knowing it, and it based on, it's based on this fact, which I'm now going to tell you. Fact. The geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue lambda is less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity of the same. That's a fact. And it's a useful fact because this now provides us yet another way to, to examine, especially that first kernel up there. So what I would argue here, knowing this fact, is that the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue 0, which is the top part of this board, is 1. Therefore, the geometric multiplicity is 1 or less. And it can't be less than 1, or else it wouldn't be an eigenvalue. So the geometric multiplicity has to be at least 1 if it's an eigenvalue. And so because the al algebraic multiplicity is 1, then it's got to be a one-dimensional kernel. In the second case, though, the algebraic multiplicity is 2. So the geometric multiplicity could have been 1 or 2. And in this case, it's 1. That's it. We found it. It's the only one. But it could have been two. OK, now I say it's a sad fact because we would like to have a basis of all of R3 in this case, 3 by 3, where all the vectors in the basis are eigenvectors. eigenvectors right? But you can't always do it. And this is an example. We can find here's a space, one dimensional for eigenvalue 0. Here's a space, one dimensional for eigenvalue 1. And there's a sort of missing dimension here. So that 
the fact that this is not equals is the problem. Now, if the okay, what do the algebraic multiplicities of all the eigenvalues add up to if we have uh, n real eigenvalues? Well, they add up to n. They'd, even this, though, might be less than n unless we use complex. Well, I'm sorry, when I say less than n, I should write the sum of all algebraic multiplicities is less than or equal to n. And it equals n if we use complex eigenvalues. And that's in section 7.5, so more on that soon. But I want to point out so that in this case we have 1 and 2, and they add up to 3, which is the dimension. But the geometric multiplicity is the add to less. All right, now there is a proof in the book of why the geometric multiplicity has to be less than or equal to it, uh, the algebraic multiplicity. And it's sort of messy, but I just want to sort of show you a a nice picture that comes from the proof. I'm not going to go into the full details of it, but just so you can sort of understand, in order to motivate it, I want an example of a 3 by 3 matrix that has an eigenvalue of 2 with multiplicity 3. So I want a 3 by 3 that has an eigenvalue of 2 with both algebraic and geometric multiplicity 3. Anyone think of such a matrix? Someone else, you've answered a number of questions. You want to have a go? Uh, the matrix that scales two, so two times the identity. In fact, that's probably, I believe, the only example. I'm going out on a limb. All right, so there's an example where, yes, every vector in Rn is an, eigen, is an eigenvector of eigenvalue 2. It just scales everything by 2. In fact, that's clearly the only possibility for such a matrix. All right, so that's a sort of extreme example. Now, here's the deal. Suppose I had a 2 by 2 matrix, on the other hand. I'm sorry, a 3 by 3 matrix again where the eigenvalue of 2 has geometric mul multiplicity perhaps less than 3. Well, what would that look like? What would that look like? What if it was even more than three-dimensional, but I only knew that the geometric multiplicity was, say, 2? Well, the idea is that there would still be some basis so that it looks like this, 0, with all zeros here. The idea being that if the geometric multiplicity, say, so say geometric multiplicity of lambda equals 2 happens to be 2, then there are two eigenvalues, eigenvectors, which are independent for that eigenvalue because the space of eigenvectors for this eigenvalue is two-dimensional. That's what the geometric multiplicity means. So if that's the case, you could change the basis so that we have 2 and 2 by 1, 0, 0. So I'm going to change the basis so one of the eigenvalues is this and the other eigenvalue is this. Uh, one of the eigenvectors. I can't. Tongue-tied here. This is one eigenvector in the new basis. This is another eigenvector in the new basis. And clearly, the matrix then has to look like two zero 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 two because when you multiply this, you get two lots of that. And when you multiply that second vector, you get twice it as well. All right. Doesn't this mean you need to have two non-independent vectors? If, if you have two eigenvectors. Means that there are two non-independent vectors in the kernel of a minus lambda. No, I don't think so. Okay, so if I'm saying the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue happens to be two, that means the kernel of a minus lambda i is two-dimensional. So that means there are two linearly independent vectors in that kernel. If it's 
If a subspace has dimension 2, you, you find two linearly independent vectors in it. And no more. Right? And that would have to be linearly dependent, because the dimension of the subspace is 2. Remember, the dimension is the maximum number of linearly independent vectors you can find. And you can find that maximum. In that example, you had two independent vectors. Which example? Here? <laughs> right. No, in that example, I, the, I found one vector in the kernel of the subspace for, for one. So the dimension of the kernel is only one. So the geometric multiplicity is one. Right. OK? So I'm assuming in my sort of pseudo proof here that I've got, in, for an n by n matrix, I have lambda happens to be two, rather confusingly, sorry about that, has a dimension, uh, has a, a, multipli a geometric multiplicity of two. So I'm saying I can find two eigenvectors for that, which are independent. Ah, the eigenvectors are Eigenvectors are independent for the same eigenvalue. <laughs> in fact, there's a plane of eigenvectors for that eigenvalue, okay. too. And I'm saying I can change the basis so that two of the eigenvectors in the new basis become these simple vectors, in which case the matrix, with respect to this new basis, will have the first column of just two, and the second column zero, two, and everything else zero. And this, this matrix is similar to the original matrix. And similar matrices have the same characteristic polynomial. Therefore, they have, well, that's all I really care about, because the characteristic polynomial of this new matrix will be 2 minus lambda, 2 minus lambda, or rather, the matrix itself is all zeros here and stuff here. But the characteristic polynomial is going to look like 2 minus lambda squared times other junk if I expand along here and then here. And so the point being that if you have a, a geometric multiplicity of, say, 2 for the eigenvalue 2, then with respect to some other basis, you find a new matrix, i.e. a similar matrix, that has 2's on the diagonal, and therefore it will have a factor of 2 minus lambda squared in this case in the characteristic polynomial. Now there may be in this other stuff, actually it's only this stuff that matters, but it may be that this other stuff may also have a factor of 2 minus lambda or more, in which case the algebraic multiplicity could be higher because there's extra 2 minus lambda. And that's actually what happens in this example here. You can find, because of this, you can find a matrix that is similar to it, to the original, where you have a 1 on the diagonal in this first space, and then other stuff here. By changing the basis, you can make that happen, because eigenvalue 1 comes up with geometric multiplicity 1. And as it turns out, the determinant of the rest of the stuff gives you another 1 factor. But just by looking at the geometry alone, you cannot get both factors because there's only one eigenvector or one dimensional eigenvector. OK, so you don't need to know this proof, but I just want you to be aware that having a geometric multiplicity, as in actually having the eigenvectors to play around with, allows you to transform the matrix into a similar matrix where you get a number of diagonal, a part of the matrix is diagonal. OK, so compare that to this classic example of 1, 1, 0, 1. That's a classic example. If you go through the motions, I'll do it on this board here because it's sort of the most basic example of a problematic 2 by 2 matrix, meaning not the full multiplicity. So if I start with 1, z 1, 1, 0, 1, call that A. So the determinant of a minus lambda i is very straightforward. It's just 1 minus lambda, 1 minus lambda. So of course, you just get 1 minus lambda all squared. So the only eigenvalue is 1. And so now, if you compute debt a minus 1 times the identity, you get the determinant of this lovely matrix. I'm sorry, not the determinant. I need the kernel. Oops. Kernel is the kernel of this 
which is clearly the span of one zero. The second coordinate has to be zero because of this. All right, so you have one eigenvector of one zero. And so this matrix is not similar to the identity. In fact, no matrix is similar to the identity except for itself, as it turns out. But it's not even similar to a multiple of the identity. In two by two, if you only have one eigenvalue, such as in this case, then the geometric multiplicity cannot be two unless it's the identity or a multiple of the identity. And this is sort of a canonical example of when that doesn't occur. Okay, so the point being that this matrix is similar to a matrix, in fact it is a matrix with a 1 and a 0. So that by itself, that first column, you can immediately see that 1 comma 0 is an eigenvector of eigenvalue 1. But the rest of it, it doesn't look diagonal. And you don't have two diagonals with just a 1. We'll talk about this a little more very soon. So any questions about anything that I've said? Sort of <coughs> theoretical, but I've given some examples as well. All right, so I mentioned the notion of a basis where all of the elements are eigenvectors. And this is called an eigenbasis. So eigenbasis of, R of A is a basis of Rn where all n basis vectors are eigenvectors of A. So it doesn't make sense to say, oh, this is an eigenbasis, unless you actually have a matrix in mind for which it's an eigenvector. I, uh, for which the basis vectors are eigenvectors. All right. Now, you cannot always find this. Okay. And an example is exactly this one here. It's exactly what I said. There, there are only two vectors in R three, which, or them, their spans, which are eigenvectors. So the most you can span out of the two together, even mixing them, is a plane in R three. So you cannot always find an eigenbasis. In fact, you can only find this if the sum of the geometric multiplicities of all eigenvalues is n. You can only find it if the sum is n. So for example, in this 2, 2, 2 matrix up here, the geometric multiplicity of 2 is 3. That's the only eigenvalue. But 3 is already the dimension of the space. OK, so that's the, that's the idea. And you know, to find it, all you have to do is, is throw together all the eigenvalues that you found, if you found enough. So remember, we did one with three different eigenvalues, the first example, and we found three different eigenvectors. Well, guess what? They automatically form an eigenbasis for Rn of, you, of that matrix A. So you can look back at the previous example, see those three vectors that we found for eigenvalues 0, 1, and minus 1, and you will find that's an eigenbasis of R3 for that matrix. Okay. Whereas you cannot find it for this matrix. There is no eigenbasis for that second matrix. And so it ties along with the fact that I just erased the geometric multiplicity, the sum of them has to be less than the sum of the algebraic multiplicities, which is itself less than or equal to n. And so if everything is equal to n, then that's when you find this eigenbasis. Now, I'm almost, almost done. Almost done. In fact, I guess I never, well, I did this a little bit before, but Just a couple of words about similar matrices, and then I'm on to the next section. We've sort of seen this before, but let's just enumerate certain things. So 
A similar to B means that's just by way of review. And so similar matrices have the same <coughs> characteristic polynomial. I just mentioned that. But let's just reiterate that. Why is it true? It's true because the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to the determinant of S B S inverse minus lambda I, which is the same as the determinant of S B minus lambda I S inverse. Wait, why is that true? Well, if you expand this out, S B S inverse is the first term. S lambda i s inverse, well, the i is nothing, and the lambda is just the scalar. So this is lambda s inverse, which is the identity. So check that. Check that you believe that just by expanding it out. And in any case, the determinant of the product, you can change the order of the term. So this is the same as, actually, maybe I'll consider, I'll write it like this. I'll take this matrix times this matrix, and I'll write the second matrix first, and then the first matrix second. You can do that with the determinant. Remember, the determinant of AB is the same as the determinant of BA. We saw that. And so these cancel now. It's not true without the determinant around it. I'm not saying these matrices commute, but the determinant, it's allowed. And so you get the determinant of B minus lambda i. So the determinant of A minus lambda i is the same as the determinant of B minus lambda i. All right, so they have the same characteristic polynomial. That's a pretty powerful statement. Therefore, they have the same trace, same determinant. Because after all, the trace and the determinant are just coefficients within the characteristic polynomial. What else do I want to have? We've already seen they have the same rank. Uh, just by way of summary, I should say they have the same rank, the same nullity. And in fact, they have the same, what else do I want to say? S they have the same eigenvalues. with algebraic and geometric multiplicity. The algebraic is obvious because they have the same characteristic polynomial. So the factorization has to be the same. Geometric's a little more subtle. And you have to argue by looking at the actual uh, geometry of the situation. So on the other hand, I do want to point out that they do not have the same, not necessarily, the same kernel or the same image or the same eigen spaces, i.e. eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Right. So they have the same eigenvalues, as in the numbers are the same, but the eigenvectors need not be the same. And that's consistent with the fact that you've changed the geometry. So there's different vectors going on, but so the kernel is different, the image is different, and these eigenvectors are different. But the actual numbers, as in the trace, the determinant, the rank, which is just a dimension, nullity, which is a dimension, and the eigenvalues, so that somehow the numbers are the same, but the vectors are not. That's an easy way to remember this. Okay? So if I had to summarize all of that. Similar matrices have the same numbery type of stuff, not the same vectory type of stuff. All right, any other questions on 7.3? Well, let's move on to 
All right, 7.4 is a pretty important topic, which really runs into 8.1 in a way. But we'll have a brief detour. Similar matrices have the same polynomial, just understanding that they have the same trace and the same. Oh, you mean right? Okay, I'm going to pull this down. You're saying, how do I get from here to here? Yeah. Well, to get from there to there, work backwards and see that you can get from here to here. Okay, so what I said is, if you expand this out, you get two terms. The first is S, B, S inverse, and the other term looks like this. S, lambda I, S inverse. Okay, lambda comes out the front because it's just a scalar. And then the identity times S is just S, and then S times its inverse is just the identity. So that, that's it. All right, another question. You had mentioned um, about the 2 by 2 matrices if they can have a, a, a dimension, and their identity is going to have a dimension of 2. Unless they're a multiple of the identity. The zero matrix is a multiple of the identity. Okay. It's zero times the identity, and it has an eigenvalue of lambda, of lambda equals zero with algebraic and geometric multiples. Yeah. Okay. It's also a very boring matrix, but an important one. We couldn't do anything without it. So. But it is a multiple of the identity. Sure. Diagonalization. As I said, it's pretty important. And we've more or less done it in a way. So. If there's an eigenbasis, for A, say like this, V1, V2, up to Vn, with corresponding eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, where this is now possibly including repeats. Repeats here, as in you can have these some of these eigenvalues being the same as some of the others. But when I say corresponding, I mean lambda 1 is the eigenvalue for the eigenvector v1, lambda 2 goes with v2, etc. So lambda n goes with vn. So if you have that, then with respect to the basis, then if you change basis, to V1 up to Vn, I claim A should become this matrix, lambda 1, lambda 2 up to lambda n with all zeros everywhere else, i.e. diagonal. All right, so this goes to the change of basis. Why is it true? Well, in the new basis, so if you want, in the new basis is just 1, 0, 0 by definition. If you change basis, then in the new basis, and we have a notation for this, i.e. this with a b subscript, but I, I, let's not get bogged down by notation. In the new basis, if I say 1, 0, 0, 0, I just mean v1. And so if I take d times 1, 0, 0, I clearly just get lambda 1 times 1, 0, 0. So what this is saying is, in the new basis, 1, 0, 0, 0 is an eigenvector for this diagonal matrix with eigenvalue lambda 1. And that, in the old basis, is the same thing as saying V1 is an eigenvector for A with eigenvalue lambda 1, which it is. And then you do repeat for all the different eigenvectors in this eigenbasis, and you'll see that you get this. So. In other words, A is similar to a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements are the eigenvalues. Now let's just write it out then in gory detail. What I want to do is let S be equal to the matrix V1 up to Vn, as we've been doing. So that's the change of basis matrix. 
and let D be this diagonal matrix from before. With all zeros off the diagonal. Okay, so what I'm claiming is that A is equal to S B S index. That's what I'm claiming. I.e. A is similar to the diagonal matrix D. By virtue of there being an eigenbasis. This has to be an eigenbasis. For A. If one does not exist, such as it did in that last two, three by three example, example one, one, then you cannot do this diagonal construction. So I'm going to say A is diagonalizable. Can can be diagonalized, i.e., similar to a diagonal matrix. Okay, so let's just sort of see why A should be equal to S, D, S inverse. The easy way is to check that is <coughs> to S inverse A, S. Let's just look at this matrix. So let's call this matrix M. Let M be S inverse A, S. And I ask you, what is M, E1? Me one. No, M times E1. Well, this is S inverse A, and let's write out S. <coughs> so that's S, that matrix, times the vector 1, 0, 0. That's what E1 is. OK, so if I multiply this by this, I just get the first column. So that's S inverse A V1. The one in the first column, in the first uh, row here, picks out the first column when you multiply it out. Now A V1 is just lambda 1 times V1. And the lambda 1 being a scalar can come out. So now I just need to know what is S inverse of V1. Well, Hey, it's got to be Mozart's sonata number one in the wrong key. Um, it's supposed to be in C major. Tell your cell phone manufacturer. It's like E major. All right. Uh, S inverse V1 is E1. S inverse V1 is E1. How do I know that? Because S E1 is V1. We just said that. S E1, <laughs> we just have this, and that's simplified to V1. So, i.e., I'll write that out again. S E1 was V1. So, S inverse V1 is E1. All right, so what I'm saying is M E1 is lambda 1 E1. And there's nothing special about 1. In fact, M E I is lambda i e i. So the eigenvalues are the same, lambda 1 through lambda n, and the eigenvectors are just the sort of standard basis vectors. So m b i e m equals lambda 1 up to lambda n. And I'm now going to call this d for diagonal. So what was m is actually d. And indeed, d is s inverse a s, because it's the same as m. And if you rearrange by multiplying on the left by S and the right by A by S inverse, you get the similarity that we were looking for. So I called it M, but I could have called it D. I just didn't want to sort of assume it was diagonal. Yes? What I'm saying is if you can find an eigenbasis, then with respect to that eigenbasis, the matrix is diagonal. What is so nice about a diagonal matrix? Well, there's a number of things, but the most obvious is that you can take big powers. You can take big powers of the matrix. So in order, to, in order to sort of motivate that, I'll do an example. Let A be equal to this matrix before. 3, 0, minus 2, 
minus 7, 0, 4, 4, 0, minus 3. We found before that an eigenbasis is, and here was the eigenvector for eigenvalue 0, here was the one for 1, of course you could use a multiple of n these vectors and it would be correct as well, uh, 1 minus 1, 2. And the eigenvalues are 0, 1, and minus 1, respectively. You have to match them up for this to work. As I said, you have some freedom. This could be 0, 3, 0. That would be OK. 0, minus 1, 0. Minus 1, 3, minus 1. Some multiple of each of these is fine. You could even change the order of these, provided that you also change the order of the eigenvalues. But because there are three distinct eigenvectors that we definitely have an eigenbasis because it's only three dimensional and therefore we can say without even thinking just by this theorem or this result it is a theorem I can say that A is equal to S D S inverse where very specifically S is the matrix formed by the columns of the eigenbasis whose columns are the eigenbasis in, in order. The diagonal is the eigenvalues in correct order, 0, minus, uh, 0, 1, minus 1. And then, of course, the same S matrix, but with the inverse, which I am not going to compute right now. So that's S, that's D. That's its inverse. And if you didn't believe it, you could actually multiply it out and check. You'd need to compute the inverse first. Pretty nice, huh? Maybe. Maybe it's nice. Okay, so I, I want to emphasize that there's not just one way of doing it. Again, if you write these out in a different order, then this S matrix is going to change. You'll be switching the columns around. But it's OK, because you'll be switching the positions of the 0, 1, and minus 1 corresponding that 0. All the other zeros are always negative. Right. And it, again, it doesn't matter if one of the columns, as in the eigenvalue, uh, eigenvectors that you choose, are multiplied by a constant. So if you put, for example, a 4 here, it would be OK if you also put a 4 there. The inverse will make it wash away. But I'm not going to put the 4 there. All right. Now, I have a question. What is the 99th power of A? Well, we've seen how to take powers with similar matrices, but let's, let's just remind ourselves. I'm going to write it as SDS inverse to the 99th, which means that you effectively write out SDS inverse SDS inverse 99 times. 99 times. But a beautiful thing happens because this S inverse ca cancels out that S. This inverse, S inverse cancels out a mysterious S that is in dot dot dots. Everything in the middle cancels out. This one cancels out as well. So all these pairs cancel out and you get S D D D D D D D D D D D D D S inverse. 99 times otherwise known as S D to the 99 S inverse. So, by the way, you should not be writing that out when you do it. If you, if you should know this. You should know that S D or any matrix there to the power N is S D to the N S inverse. That, that's a fact. You should just know. It's for any matrix, any square matrices. In fact, let me not use an N. Let me use a <coughs> A T. Well, let's let's use a capital. I, I just don't want to confuse the size of the matrix n by n with the power that we take here. Capital N will do. All right. So that's something you ought to know, but it doesn't rely on D being diagonal. It does rely on S being invertible, but otherwise this just doesn't make sense anyway. All right. So the point being that 
For a diagonal matrix, it's very easy to take a high power. You just take half the power of the diagonal elements. If you don't believe it, multiply it out. You'll see, for a diagonal matrix, it's just like a collection of numbers. Anything that you do pretty much just operates independently on the numbers. The diagonal <laughs> matrices are, in some sense, very similar to vectors or just, just n individual numbers. So in particular, in our case, it's S, this matrix 0, 1, minus 1 to the power 99, S inverse, which is S, 0, 1 to the 99, minus 1 to the 99. Actually, there's 0 to the 99 as well. And it's traditional not even to write. If it's diagonal, you pretty much can just leave out the off diagonals or just put a big blobby 0 there. And the beautiful thing is 0 to the 99, 1 to the 99, and minus 1 to the 99 are all equal to themselves. So this is S, 0, 1, minus 1, S inverse. And that happens to be the same as A. So A to the 99 is the same as A in this example. Pretty nice. You'd never work that out by multiplying A by itself 99 times. Of course, A cubed by the same logic also happens to be equal to A. So A to the fifth is as well. And so is A to the seventh. So maybe you'd get the pattern once you worked out A cubed. On the other hand, if you wanted to compute a to the 100, then you'd have to do a little bit more work. So let's just try that. But a to the 100 would be equal to s d to the 100 s inverse which would be this matrix S that we had before. The hundredth power of the diagonal is now 0, 1, 1 times S inverse. So you'd have to actually compute S inverse if you wanted to do it this way. Of course, so you need to find this. Of course, if you want to be truly sneaky, you do A to the 100 is A to the 99 times a, and we just saw that's the same as a, so that's a squared. And multiply it out by itself, which is eminently easier than taking the inverse of something. Now, that is just a nice example or a very specific example because the eigenvalues are all 0, 1, and minus 1. And so the 99th power happened to be the same. But if the eigenvalues say 2, then when you take the 99th power, you'll have a 2 to the 99 in the diagonal there instead of a 1, and it becomes considerably messier, and there's no shortcuts in general for that. Okay, so to take the large power of a matrix, see if you can find an eigenbasis write down the diagonalization just by it's just a repackaging of what we did in the previous section okay it's just a repackaging everything that i've said is more or less writing the same sort of thing in different ways it, it, i haven't i've only had one new idea in the whole time oh, sorry it's an hour, hour quarter but it's essentially all a one trick pony and then you uh, take the big power of the diagonal and work out the inverse. I, I've shied away from actually finding it, but we know how to find inverses. We know how to find inverses. All right, so in summary, <coughs> before I do this, let me make sure there's nothing else to say about this section. Nope, that's pretty much it. In summary. This is the idea. <coughs> so first of all, so here's everything we know about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, essentially. So if we want to understand eigenbases, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, to find the eigenvalues, solve, as I said, determinant of a minus lambda i equals 0 
for the variable lambda. Okay, for each lambda, find the lambda, which is the kernel of A minus lambda I n by Gauss Jordan elimination, essentially. So you plug it in and you work it out, do your Gauss Jordan elimination. If the sum of the dimensions of all E lambda, i.e. the sum of all the geometric multiplicities, by definition, is n, you have an eigenbasis. So they all you get an eigenbasis. And the way you get it is essentially by picking enough eigenvectors from all these kernels here, from all these eigenspaces. So you get the eigenbasis by putting together <laughs> the uh, bases for all the E lambdas. So if there was a two-dimensional eigenspace, you just pick a basis for that. And then another comment. So two comments about three. And then I'll then four. So, sub comment one. If geometric sum of the geometric mults is less than n, no eigenbasis. And comment number two. If there are n distinct eigenvectors, eigenvalues, as in n different eigenvalues, each algebraic and geometric multiplicity, each e lambda, has dimension 1. And there are n of them. And there are n. So there is an eigenbasis automatically. So that was the case in the example of the 3 by 3 matrix. You had three eigenvalues, 0, 1, and minus 1. We automatically know, since there are three eigenvalues and the dimension is 3, that you have an eigenbasis. You don't have to do anything else. It's all. I mean, you have to find it, but you're guaranteed its existence. And then finally, pack together the change of basis matrix S and the diagonal matrix D, and write A is S, D, S, and S. Done. OK, so that's the summary of the situation. And you could use this for large powers. Of A via A to the N is S D to the N S inverse. And it's easy to take the nth power of the diagonal matrix. Okay, so that's the complete summary of the situation. All right, so I've sort of given an example already with that 3x3 three three matrix over here. So again, it's worth doing many more examples. I'd be happy to come up with something or answer anyone's questions before moving on to the next section. All right, so just in terms of the terminology, it's 
we say A, as I said, is diagonalizable. In the case where the subcomment, if the geometric multiplicities add up to less than N, there's no eigenbasis, so A is not diagonalizable. No eigenbasis is the same thing as not diagonalizable, and vice versa. Eigenbasis and diagonalizable are the same thing. Or well, there is an eigenbasis and diagonalizable. It's the same thing. A question. Um, I this earlier. But why, uh, why in that example, are all of A equal to A? Well, I mean, 0 to the 99 is 0. 1 to the 99 is 1. And minus 1 to the 99 is minus 1. And the same would be true if you replaced 99 by any odd number. Right? Odd powers of 0, 1, and minus 1 are all equal to themselves. Why would like, 0, 1, and minus 1 make it the same? Well, if you look at it this way, A by itself is S, D, S inverse. Yeah. Right? So A, in that example, A is S, D, S inverse. A cubed is S, D cubed. We, we just decided D cubed is D. In this particular very oh, yeah. special case. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the same as S D S inverse, which happens to be A. So once you know A cubed is the same as A, well, okay. then everything else follows. Okay, so, right. So, and, and when I say everything else follows, I mean, you could write an induction sort of thing if you want to work out A to the fifth, even without this diagonalization. This would be a cubed a squared, but a cubed is just the same as a, so this is a a squared, which is a cubed, which is a. <laughs> so actually, if a cubed equals a, then, then a to the fifth must equal a, as must a to the seventh. But you know, you can see it directly as well from the diagonalization. Okay, so in terms of dynamical systems, again, we already saw the power of large. Uh, well, we saw the virtue of being able to diagonalize and take large powers. That meant doing multiple iterations of the dynamical system. And it's just a geometrical interpretation of everything we've said. So this is a powerful idea, and you need to do practice on it. But notice that, as I said, everything is sort of encapsulated in this summary. That's everything that we know pretty much about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, except for the characteristic polynomial. All right, so important stuff. All right, so a bit of comic relief is just a couple of words on complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I say a bit of comic relief because it will probably take about 10 minutes and then I'm going to go on to 8.1 which you should have just covered in class recently and that is the sort of big, that's the big theorem of the course or one of the big ones anyway, the spectral theorem. But before we do that, a little bit of a word about complex eigenvalues. Okay. Rather, I'm not going to do a full review of complex numbers. You've probably done a bit in class and you've seen these things over and over again. I hope. So complex numbers, complex eigenvalues really. And eigenvectors. Okay, so we've done this. We've taken f of lambda, which was the determinant of a minus lambda i. And we've seen this is a polynomial of degree n. So it basically looks like plus or minus lambda to the n. And then we'll have a trace of a times lambda to the n minus 1, and so on, and then plus, and there's actually a minus 1 to the n here, I think. And then you have plus the determinant of a in the last space. So we've seen this. I don't want to get too bogged down in this form. Basically, it's a polynomial of degree n or less. Actually, it has to be degree n. It can't be less. It's a polynomial of degree n in lambda. So polynomials of degree n don't necessarily have n roots, at least not n real roots. In fact, they might have none, but only if n is even. So, so f of lambda has no more than n real roots, 
it has at least one real root, if n is odd. But otherwise, you can't say much more in general. On the other hand, there is this nice fundamental theorem of algebra that says it has exactly n common multiple roots. Has exactly n complex roots, counting multiplicity, counting algebraic multiplicity. And a nice thing is that if the entries of A are real, which they are basically in our case, I mean, there's nothing to stop you from putting complex numbers in the elements of a matrix. And that, that's fine. That's, there's a valid theory for that. But if A has real entries, as it does in this course, then the coefficients in the polynomial F A are real. And there's a nice theorem that is in complex numbers that says that if you have a real polynomial, all the complex roots occur in conjugate pairs. So the complex roots occur in conjugate pairs. In other words, i.e., if lambda equals a plus ib is a root, so is lambda equals a minus ib. You get the other one for free. That's true for any polynomial. But in this case, the roots of the polynomial are eigenvalues. So in our context, i.e. Eigenva <laughs> eigenvalues complex eigenvalues, I should say, occur in conjugate pairs. So if you have, for example, a 2 by 2 matrix with no eigenvalues in the real sense, well, it will have two eigenvalues that happen to be complex conjugates of each other. So let's just look at that example for a little bit. So specifically, say A is 2 by 2. So it looks like this. And you look at de you look at F A of lambda, which is the determinant of a minus lambda, b minus lambda, b c. Okay, let's actually write that out. We've done it once before. You'll get a minus lambda, d minus lambda, minus b c. And if you expand this out, you get lambda squared minus a plus b lambda. plus a d minus b. So that's the determinant, and that's the trace. So that's consistent with what I had before. Actually, maybe it isn't. Maybe I need a minus there. Oops. Anyway, doesn't matter. Take a look at this. That's a quadratic. Its discriminant is what? This is a quadratic with discriminant equal to b squared minus 4ac, which is a bit of a mess. It's actually not too bad. It's a squared plus 2ad plus d squared minus 4ad plus 4bc. And if you factor it, you actually get a minus d all squared plus 4bc. 
Okay, now that quantity, this is always positive, true. But B and C, one of them could be quite big and positive, and the other one could be quite big and negative. So actually, this number could be negative. So this could be negative. In which case, there would be no eigenvalues in this 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, Don't memorize this, I'm just showing you. But at least you understand the concept of how to find this in the 2 by 2 case. If that's the case, if so, there would be two complex eigenvectors, eigenvalues. All right, so let's just take a look at what happens in that case. No, I don't want to say too much more about the complex case. It's of interest, but the book doesn't really give it the sort of full treatment, so neither will I. Makes more sense if you actually allow matrices with complex entries, then, then you really need this complex case. But in any case, so if, so suppose that A is two by two. And has two complex eigenvector eigenvalues. Which I'll write lambda <coughs> bless you. Again, if the book to be consistent with the book, I'm going to write A plus or minus I. But here A and B are different from from before. And when I say different from before, I mean <laughs> they're not the first row of the matrix anymore. I'm just saying these are the two eigenvalues. So again, that would come in the case where this polynomial here, this quadratic, has negative discriminant. When you try to solve, use the quadratic formula here, you will find that you get minus, you know, minus something plus or minus the square root of something else, and that something else is negative, so it pops out an i. Okay, so okay, okay, we'll get you at that. Now, here's the thing. Say that we look at what happens when we take a times a corresponding eigenvector that you find by using the kernel with of, of a minus lambda i. So we take v plus i w is equal to say a plus i b times v plus i w. Okay, so I want you to think of this as a x equals lambda one x. So I'm calling x this complex vector v plus i w, where v and w are just regular old real vectors. And so this equation says that ax is lambda 1x, where lambda 1 is that complex number. And I'm, I'm going to set lambda 1 as a plus ib, and lambda 2 is a minus ib. OK, well, if you have this equation, then what? Well, you can manipulate things a little bit. You find by expanding that AB plus IAW equals AV minus BW, that's the real part, plus IBV plus AW. So it's not true that V or W are eigenvectors of A by themselves. Remember, A has no eigenvectors. But it does have a complex eigenvector in that sense. In fact, we can say AV equals AV minus BW. And we can also say AW equals BV plus AW. And this is by equating real and imaginary parts. That's what we've done. I've just equated this real part here and this imaginary part there. And if you actually pack this back together as a v minus a 
minus i a w and go through the motions, you find that you actually get, so you have to do this computation, but just by computing, you'll find that you actually get a minus i b So in other words, V minus IW, A lots of that, is lambda 2, well, so you get that equation which says that A times X conjugate equals lambda 2 X conjugate where x conjugate I'm interpreting as v minus i w. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, okay, you find the two eigenvalues are a plus or minus i b. And you find an eigenvector, which is v plus i w. The other eigenvector for the other eigenvalue is just v minus i w. That's what it turns out to be. And indeed, a becomes similar to the following matrix, which you can just read from the coefficients of v and w if you switch basis to V and W, in fact, W and V is the nicer way of doing it. So switch basis W V, and you see from these equations that AW goes to little aw plus BV. And AV, the second basis, goes to minus VW times AV. And so you find that A becomes the matrix A, let me get this right, minus B, B, A, which we've seen as a rotation and a scaling together. So in other words, A equals S, A minus B, B, A, S inverse where S equals W, V. So you reverse, you put the imaginary first. If you put the real first, there's no crime, it's just the minus goes in the other place. Okay, so what does this all mean? What I've just presented for you is a two by two form of diagonalization where you can't actually diagonalize. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, there's no eigenvalues real. So there's no eigenvectors, really. All right, so you can't diagonalize it. But you can make A similar to a rotation matrix and a scale. So in some sense, for two by two matrices, you either have the canonical matrices are either diagonal or rotation scaling com combos. And everything is similar to one of those. Every two by two matrix is similar to one of those. If there are two eigenvectors, then you get something like that. If there's only one eigenvector, okay, so when I say everything is similar, I have to be a little bit careful. Everything except for the case of this type of phenomenon. So this is another class here where C is not zero. So I have to be a little bit careful. That's a more complicated case. So all the cases where the geometric multiplicities in the complex sense is, is equal to 2 of a 2 by 2 matrix come down to either rotation scaling or diagonal. But uh, doesn't the fundamental theorem say that that's true for that one as well? Well, when you look at that one, the eigenvalues are A and B. So it has two eigenvalues. Now, if they're different, then everything is good. If they're the same, then things are not so good. Okay. If they're the same, you might only have a geometric multiplicity of one, and then this theory doesn't work. So that's sort of a third canonical example. So that, that I think, exhausts everything. That plus, yeah, those type of examples are it. Right now, obviously, for three by three and higher, it's not so pretty at all. Um, but I just want you to appreciate this as a sort of consolation diagonalization. All right? So. I could give a more specific example, but I kind of need to go on to 8.1. Only 20 minutes left. And I really want to finish everything next week so that we've got a few weeks off and then we can do the review of everything. But if there are any questions about any of that stuff,
so far, I'd be happy to take it. Right. All right. Yeah. Now, here's the crowning glory. Perhaps. Spectral theorem. So, spectral is a sort of strange word. We haven't come across it before, and it's not really explained, I don't think, in the book. The idea is that the set of eigenvector, eigenvalues rather, is called the spectrum of A in more advanced type of applications. There is more, if A is an infinite dimensional matrix, which you can't really write down, but if it's an infinite dimensional linear transformation, um, then you can get eigenvalues which are not true eigenvalues and form a sort of spectrum, as it were. And indeed, there's an interpretation in terms of optics where the actual light that you see can be thought of as, a, as eigenvalues of a certain linear operator in the transformation. So the word spectrum comes from optics. And it finds its way into the spectral theorem. It has nothing to do with a spectre like a ghost. It's, it's or in James Bond for that matter. It's just a spectrum from optics. And here is what it essentially says. So in order to motivate it, let's just look at the following sort of question. Okay, we've seen maybe there's an eigenbasis. This gives diagonalizable. A is S, D, S inverse. Okay, we've seen that already. Now the question we'd like to ask is, what if the eigenbasis is orthonormal? Well, it clearly gives A equals S, D, S inverse. But because this is orthonormal, the columns of S are orthonormal. Therefore, S is orthogonal. Remember, one of the characterizations of an orthogonal matrix is that the columns are an orthonormal basis. All right, so if there's an orthonormal basis, then you write A equals S, D, S inverse, but S is not just any old matrix, it's an orthogonal matrix. Or it can be done as an orthogonal matrix. All right, so what does this mean? This means that A is actually equal to S, D, S transpose. Because orthogonal means S inverse equals S transpose. saw that. The transpose of S is its own inverse. In particular, if you take A transpose, you get S, D, S transpose, transpose. And reversing, you get S transpose, transpose, D transpose, S transpose. Well, the transpose of the transpose is the original. And the transpose of a diagonal matrix is itself. If you think about it, it's diagonal. You flip around all the non-diagonal elements and they're all zero anyway. So this is just D. You get S transpose. That's just A. So A transpose equals A. So we're along the chain then. If there was not just an eigenbasis, but an orth orthonormal eigenbasis, then you could write A equals S, D, S inverse, where S is orthogonal. And then this computation shows that A transpose equals A. So A is symmetric. What the spectral theorem says is that the converse is true. If A is symmetric, then there's an orthonormal eigenbasis. And that is the theorem that well, I, that I get to over. over. All right, so spectral theorem says the converse. Ah. 
Spectral theorem says the converse. If A is symmetric, i.e. A transpose is A itself. We've already looked at some symmetric matrices in the past. So if A is symmetric, then A has an eigenbasis consisting of, well, orthonormal vectors. i.e. you might say A has an orthonormal orthonormal eigen basis. Okay, so it's not even obvious that if A is symmetric that it even has an eigen basis. Remember <coughs> some matrices, actually most in some sense, don't even have an eigen basis. Maybe most do. I don't know. It depends. If the eigenvalues are all real and distinct, yes, it will have an eigenbasis. But some of the matrices don't even have n real eigenvalues, um, as we saw from the complex case. And even if they do, they might be duplicates, and the geometric multiplicity might be too low. So there isn't even necessarily an eigenbasis. I'm telling you here that if A is symmetric, then not only do you automatically know it has an eigenbasis, but I'm telling you that you can find it you can find such an eigenbasis that can, is an orthonormal basis of Rn. Now, as we saw, orthonormal bases are very nice. In particular, projections onto them become very straightforward. Projection matrices, easy. All right, so there's the theorem. Okay, anyone have any questions about it? Before I sort of justify it a little bit, not, not even prove it, but the, the facts that lead to its proof are actually important facts that you have to know in and of themselves. So, I, I mean, does it make sense as to why that theorem is saying something useful? Or at least interesting as opposed to obvious? Or are you all too tired because it's 10 20? If, if a matrix is similar to a symmetric matrix, is the matrix itself symmetric as well? The question is, if A is similar to B, Where B is symmetric. Right. So the question so B transpose is equal to B. Alright, let's take A transpose and see what we get. So we get S B S inverse transpose. And you get S inverse transpose, B transpose, S <coughs> transpose. Alright? Now this is S transpose inverse B S. So A transpose looks similar to B as well. In fact, it is similar to B. But does that mean A transpose actually equals B? Not necessarily. Okay. Now, on the other hand, maybe we could be more, maybe we could be craftier. And we could say, well, B transpose equals B and say, all right, this means that B is similar to diagonal matrix. OK, with an orthonormal or with an orthogonal change of basis matrix S. So let's try to be more crafty and write, first of all, B is equal to S, D, S inverse equals S, D, S transpose. All right. Now, A is supposed to be equal, is similar to B. So let's do, we need a different S. So let's use U. A is U, B, U inverse. And again, I think we're going to run into the same problem. You have U, S, D, S inverse, U inverse. But here, the best you can do is say US, US inverse. And just because S is orthogonal doesn't mean that so A has to be orthogonally similar to B for that to work. Anyway, never mind. We can talk about that later. So 
let us look then at why this is sort of true. I'll have just enough time in the next five or six minutes to look at a couple of facts and then next time we're going to have to do some examples. But here's the main fact that it makes it. Well, facts. One is this. If V and W are eigenvectors of A, of a symmetric matrix A, with different eigenvalues, then V is perpendicular to W. So if you have two eigenspaces, i.e. if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are not equal, and they're both eigenvalues, then the eigenspace E lambda 1 is perpendicular as a subspace the eigenspace for lambda 2. Every vector in here is perpendicular to every vector in here. That's not true in general. So for example, if you look at that 3 by 3 case from way back, way back at the beginning of the, le of the lecture, one of the vectors was 0, 1, 0, and another one I think was 1, minus 2, 1. They're not orthogonal at all. So Symmetric matrices are very special because their eigenvectors or their eigenspaces are perpendicular. Now, why do I have to say for different eigenvalues? Well, the identity, for example, 3 by 3 identity, is certainly symmetric. Everything is an eigenvector for that, for eigenvalue 1. And yet, of course, not every vector is perpendicular to every other vector. So they have to, the eigenspaces are orthogonal, really, is what this is saying. Now, why is it true? There's a proof in the book. I'm going to give a slightly different one. You may recall when we did the transpose, one of the properties of the transpose that we saw was that A, if we have A V dot W, that's the same as V dot H transpose. A V dot W is the same as V dot A transpose W. And if you don't believe that, just remember the definition of the dot product and the transpose. Remember this, here's the proof of this. This is equal to AV itself transpose W, which is equal to V transpose A transpose W, which is equal to V dot A transpose W. That's the little proof. It's just a manipulation, remember. Just, you just need to know that something dot something is the first transpose times the second. <coughs> All right, so if A is symmetric, then we have AV dot W equals V dot AW. Not A transpose W, but just A, because A equals A transpose. All right, let's suppose that V, suppose that AV is lambda 1V and AW is lambda 2W. So that we have these two eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2, which are different, and eigenvectors V and W. So that's all I'm saying. V, one, v is for lambda 1 and W is for lambda 2. All right, now let's take this equation here. This equation becomes AV is lambda 1V dot W, and AW is lambda 2W. So all I'm saying here is that lambda 1 times V dot W equals lambda 2 times V dot W. Well, if lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2, then v dot w must be 0. So v and w are orthogonal. That's the proof of the fact. OK. 
okay? But it definitely relies <coughs> on the symmetry. It's critical to have the symmetry. Because without the symmetry, you have the transpose there. And so all you can say is, well, if V, so here's the more general result. If V is an eigenvector for A, and W is an eigenvector for A transpose, and they have different eigenvalues, then yes, you're going to get this sort of orthogonality of the V and W. But that's not as interesting as them both being eigenvectors of A. And for that, you need the symmetric case. All right, so that's the proof of that fact. And it's a fact that you need to know in and of its, itself. It's, it's, you, you're supposed to know symmetric matrices have orthogonal eigenspaces. And the second fact is that all eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix are real. The symmetric matrix are real. Well, the reason for that is a little more messy, and the proof is in the book, and I, I really only have a couple of minutes, and I want to finish on time. So I'm going to say, look it up in the book. There's a nicer proof in reality, but I agree with the book that we haven't done complex dot products, and therefore we really can't do a nicer version of it. So anyway, the point is that these two facts almost give you the whole theorem. They almost give you the whole theorem because what it says is, first of all, there's a whole lot of real eigenvalues. It doesn't tell you that there are n of them. But essentially, there are, if you can go and prove that one last step, the fact that the eigenspaces are orthogonal means that for each of them, you could choose an orthonormal basis. For each individual eigenspace, you can choose an orthonormal basis. There's one for lambda 1, there's one for lambda 2, there's one for lambda 3. Some of them only have one vector. But if you throw them all together, because each of them, within an eigenspace, these two vectors are orthogonal or orthonormal, and then if you compare any other eigenspace, they're orthogonal, then the whole collection is an orthonormal basis. And so the construction of this basis that you've done will be orthonormal. Anyway, so next time we'll actually look at some examples of how it works out and how you can get an orthonormal basis, and then we'll finish the syllabus, or as much as we can.